by promoting their CSR programs or implementing and promoting new CSR programs. So this gets taken as a sort of atonement in action, like we discussed in the last podcast on ethical apology. The problem is that these may not always be effective. So the purpose of this podcast is to explore corporate social responsibility and what makes CSR programs more and less likely to be successful so that we can reflect on the limitations of using this as a response strategy for crises. Findings for CSR are frankly a bit of a mixed bag. Some studies point to a lot of positive outcomes for organizations that engage in CSR and use their CSR initiatives as a point of promotion for the organization. So on the positive side, we can see that there are findings suggesting that companies who are socially responsible often have better brand loyalty, attract better employees, can even help crisis-proof their organizations. That is, the social responsibility schemes themselves actually function to manage risk and even prevent crises from emerging. They also help promote identification between consumers and companies because people want to patronize companies they see as sharing their values and their concerns, and that CSR can improve an organization's trustworthiness and reputation. Yet there's also a lot of research on CSR where the story is less positive, and there are also consistent findings showing a difficulty improving the specific return on investment of the resources, time, personnel, and money spent on CSR programs. There's even findings that it can build up higher expectations for organizations to perform well, so if the organization commits a transgression, stakeholders can feel betrayed by that. And that certainly was the cases we've talked about in earlier podcasts with Volkswagen and the emissions scandal. Third, we're also living in an era where people are less trustworthy of organizations. They're more cynical about the authenticity of CSR, so people can often view CSR initiatives as shameless efforts to curry favor. And finally, greenwashing, specifically references to pro-environmental activities that organizations claim can be ineffective in helping improve their reputation. If we're going to try to account for this mixed bag of findings, then one of the theories that's particularly helpful in explaining it is motivation hygiene theory. Think of it like showering and using a deodorant. Both of these things make us tolerable to be around, especially on hot days, but they certainly don't make us good as people. Being a good person is a judgment about the content of our character. So if we can think of CSR in that context, then what we can see is the following. Think of the process this way. We start with some kind of CSR initiative. If people are satisfied with that initiative, then it positively affects their satisfaction with the organization and improves their intention to engage with the organization more often. However, if people are dissatisfied with that initiative, then they're more likely to be dissatisfied with the organization, and so it can harm their intention to engage with the organization. But this leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Most directly, what causes the satisfaction or dissatisfaction? So we decided to explore this in a little bit more detail. To help clarify and better understand the factors that cause satisfaction and dissatisfaction, we conducted focus groups. So we ended up with 46 participants across a number of different focus groups with PR practitioners in some groups and consumers in most of the groups because we wanted to compare and contrast how PR practitioners viewed CSR in comparison with how working class consumers viewed it. All of these people were living or working in Northern England at the time of the focus groups. So when it came to the analysis, what we wanted to do is explore the emerging themes. And so we looked for common points made across focus groups discussions to identify themes, consider the context in which they're talking about, and then evaluate what seemed particularly important to our participants. Overall, we found seven big themes and 22 corresponding attitudes. So when we're looking at these tables, the theme is the big idea. The attitude communicated fell within that, and then we identify whether it was specific to consumers and or practitioners. So at the outset, let's start with one of the biggest explanations as to why CSR initiatives may not be successful. 
practitioners often coming from more privileged backgrounds make some assumptions about social responsibility that not only fail to reflect what came out of the consumer-oriented focus groups, but also reflects a fairly middle-class and smug assumption about working-class consumers. I think one of the critical lessons learned in this study is that practitioners need to be very careful about the assumptions they make about their consumers. But let's set that aside for a moment to focus on what really seems to matter to consumers in particular. Amongst the consumers, there's a very sophisticated tension that they discussed across most of the focus groups, one that talks about their increasing expectation for organizations to just be socially responsible. However, identifying that it was not always the first thing that affects their purchasing behavior. And they also reflected a strong level of cynicism when organizations use it as a promotion tool, especially those that do that without already having a good reputation. Though consumers want to see how organizations are socially responsible, they want to find that information out on their own through media coverage, social media, and other organization-owned sites. It's just that they're more cynical when it's used as a promotional tool. They also recognize that it's hard to see good news stories in the media because so much of the traditional media or legacy media focuses on negative stories. So they're very happy to find it themselves and do go looking for companies that they're actually interested in. In a lot of the ways, it's like when a celebrity calls themselves a philanthropist compared to that description being used by others based on the good works that someone else does. At the heart of it, what emerged very clearly was that not only should CSR be something that an organization demonstrates long-term engagement with, but that it starts at home by focusing on their own employees and in their own communities rather than far off places where the impact can't be seen and realized by their neighbors, friends, and families. Finally, we also have to understand what limits social responsibility's possibilities. It's not that working class consumers don't understand the nuance of CSR. It's just that in a lot of cases, they feel their options are limited. In part, this can be limited by huge global companies where whether they use the company or not isn't going to have much of an impact. So they don't feel empowered as consumers. So they become apathetic. However, in a lot of cases, people acknowledge and recognize the realities of their situation. They still want the consumer goods. And while they would rather do business with a good company, sometimes they had to hold their nose and go with what they can afford. In a lot of ways, socially responsible consumption in their minds is a middle class problem. So what can we say about CSR and consumer behavioral intention? Well, CSR matters when it's authentic and when consumers can learn about it organically, but it's less relevant when it's connected with cause-related marketing or too disconnected from the places where people live and work. So this is good news for the field of public relations, but bad news for marketing. When we're talking about CSR from our data, it's not just that consumers aren't interested or aren't actively seeking out companies and organizations that are good and bad. It's that they just don't want it used as a point of promotion. So these findings lead us to two related models, a model for authentic CSR and a model for inauthentic CSR. And this has some pretty important implications with regards to issues in crisis management. So let's first look at authentic CSR. If an organization wants its CSR initiatives to be viewed as authentic and thus more effective, then very simply they need to show consumers that the consumer matters and consumer choice to support socially responsible organizations also matters. Second, they need to demonstrate that CSR is making a difference in the communities that their consumers live, not halfway around the world. Third, to be viewed as authentic, the organization needs to have a good reputation. So here's the sticky wicket when it comes to issues in crisis management. For CSR to seem authentic, it needs to be a part of how the organization does business on a regular basis. So when we're talking about building crisis resistant organizations, despite some of the cautions from some authors about building too high of expectations, frankly, being socially responsible demonstrates that the company is motivated to do good. 
when it comes to a crisis context, so long as a company isn't facing a transgression that they've committed time and time again, then being socially responsible is an effective way to minimize or mitigate the brand damage and the negative outcomes that come along with that during crises. But this isn't the whole story. There's more that's telling when it comes to CSR. It turns out that when it comes to stakeholders making judgments that organizations are just trying to make themselves look good or a hygiene conclusion, those judgments are formed by, first, the consumers believe that whether or not they spend money with the organization isn't really going to make the organization to decide to behave differently. Second, for CSR to matter, the impact should be local. So if we combine these first two points, people seem to want to feel like their choices have positive impact. So if they spend with a company that does good in their own communities, they are getting something out of their consumption that they can feel good about. Third, having a bad reputation means that socially responsible actions just aren't going to lead to positive outcomes, at least in the short term. However, it's important to note that there isn't a negative outcome associated with this, it's just that they fail to be effective. For organizations that have gone through a crisis that has damaged their reputation, this means they may not be able to rely on CSR to bail them out for a quick reputation fix. However, that doesn't mean that socially responsible action isn't going to help them rebuild trust and their reputation in the long term. Reputation is a long-term judgment and people want constant evidence about a company's good work. So this can still be an effective part of crisis reputation and recovery strategy. It's just that the benefits are long-term ones. Finally, promoting the company for sales and marketing purposes on the basis of its being a socially responsible company is just not persuasive. In this way, the data suggests that it it's positioning the CSR work alongside the specific action step of making a purchase or supporting the company, that that's what's ineffective about it. So talking up a company's engagement in the community is desirable, but it just cannot be a method to get a sale. The story on CSR hasn't ended there. This question of whether CSR can make an organization more crisis resilient is something that I've tested and the postscript is that when consumers are presented with information about a company that shows it to be socially responsible as a regular part of its business objectives and then a crisis is introduced, that the company suffers less reputational damage, maintains the trust of its consumers, and actually can lead to improved intention to support the company through the crisis. However, if that same company is socially irresponsible, it fares far worse. So this tells me pretty clearly that as a response strategy, social responsibility is a bad idea unless the organization has a good history and good relationships with its communities of stakeholders. However, consumers don't need to be reminded that the company is a good company when a crisis strikes. They just need it to get on with the business of correcting the problems in order for them to move on.